On one of our drives back to Kansas from Texas, we had a bad trip. To me, every trip was bad, as I hate Kansas. But one time, we ran over a dead body, plain and simple. It had a red and black plaid shirt and jeans. It was a two-lane highway going north. We were in the right-hand lane, and the body's bottom half was toward the right edge of the lane, and what used to be the head was to the left, which would have been towards the middle of the two lanes going north. You could tell it had already been run over several times. The left-hand lane, where the head was pointed towards, looked like someone had slung a bucket of red paint there. I'll never forget the sound of the crunching bones as we ran over them. This happened about two years ago, and even now I still can't forget it. I was stunned. In shock. It was probably about 3 or 4 a.m. I don't know if we were still in Texas or Oklahoma. My husband used to get off work at 3 a.m. and we went to Kansas frequently to see his kids. On those nights, he would try to get off early sometimes 12 a.m. I was always in a bad mood. It had just started to rain that night, and we were going almost 90 miles per hour, so we couldn't stop. There was a semi behind us, and maybe one car after that semi. We hadn't seen any cars going south for a long time. We continued driving at the speed for about 15 minutes, when we saw an ambulance going the opposite direction. I can only assume the truck driver called. I wanted to call 911, but... I had no idea where we were, plus, like I said, I was just in shock. I've searched the internet over and over since then to find some record, some news article of what happened, but I haven't found anything. Okay, now, I know this is creepy, but I had to post this story to explain an answer I gave in more detail. It was 22 years ago, in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I lived with my family about 35 miles outside of Santa Fe in the mountains. We had a ranch there, and it was extremely remote. We were on our way to school, which took an hour to get to, and we took the back road out of the mountain that day, instead of the front, more traveled road. This road we were on led to the highway and only the people who lived out there in these mountains even knew it was there. Well, there was a frontage road with a concrete barrier alongside it that led to the rural road that went up the mountain. Anyway, the night before, this guy was riding his motorcycle along that frontage road, thinking it led back to the highway. He was obviously lost. That frontage road went straight for a while, but then curved sharply and led into the mountain. Well, the concrete barrier curved with it. This guy was going down that road in the dark and didn't know about the sharp curve. He ended up slamming into the concrete barrier. When we came across the scene, he was lying on his back, face up and eyes open. He had blood all over his face and his bike was in pieces. His belongings were strewn all over the road. We later found out by the police that he was going around 65 miles an hour when he hit that concrete wall. They also said he'd been dead around 12 hours. It still takes us more than 30 minutes to get to Santa Fe and call the police. These were obviously the days before cell phones. Anyway, that memory stuck with me all these years, and at the time, I was only 14. I had nightmares for months. It was a pretty traumatic experience for such a young girl. Me and my older sisters still talk about that day. It was New Year's Day, 2013. We were in Koh Phangan, Thailand, and had gone to the infamous full moon party the night before. We were having breakfast at this beachfront cafe, and all of a sudden, people started yelling and pointing at the water. I said to my friend, I bet it's a body washed up. So we walk over, and sure enough, floating face down is a man about 20 feet out. There is a guy trying to get to him, but he can't make it. 
no one is doing anything and my friend looks at me and says you used to be a lifeguard you can get him i am still drunk from the night before and all i can think is what will be worse if i go out there and he's already dead or i don't and fail to save him so before i even know what i'm doing i'm in the water swimming to him once i get to him i turn him over and see that he's gone I man up and pull his body out of the water while my friends and strangers on the beach watch. Then once he's back on the beach, his friend comes over and sees that his friend is dead and breaks down. Seeing that was much worse than pulling the body out. We were pretty shaken up that day, but it was one of those experiences that will bond the five of us who were there that day forever. I had been woken up on a Sunday about two years ago. It was January and really cold, and I was in a heavy sleep when I got a call from my stepmother that my uncle had not answered his phone since Friday, and no one had heard from him, and that she would like for me to come with her to check up on him. He only lived a few blocks away at the time. My uncle had lived with my grandmother most of his life, both suffering from debilitating diseases she has serious respiratory issues, and he had contracted HIV in his 20s and suffered from addiction. She had recently been moved out into a nursing home because his constant drunkenness was proving too much of a distraction to keep him from taking care of her, so he lived on his own in their old apartment. I told my stepmother nonchalantly that I'd be dressed and downstairs in a minute because she had done this many times in the past. He would get so drunk or high that he just slept for days and didn't bother anyone, scaring us all. So I just put my shoes on and walked outside where she was waiting. I have no idea why to this day, because as I said, this has happened so many times before that I had no worry. But about 10 feet from the car, I stopped and said to myself aloud, this is not going to be good. It was as if someone had taken over my ability to speak and just said those words for me. We arrive at his apartment, and while my stepmother asks around the local junkies if they'd seen him and asks the landlord for the keys, I knock on his door loudly, yelling his name. No response. The night before, my dad and stepmother had gotten into a huge fight, and they were not on speaking terms. But once he heard that my uncle was nowhere to be found, he walked over and began trying to help us get into the apartment. At this point, my grandmother had arrived and all of us were banging on his door, yelling and screaming his name for about two minutes and calling his cell phone. Finally, once we quieted down, my dad called his cell phone again and we could hear it inside his apartment. The landlord said he literally had no keys to the apartment because he gave the last pair to my uncle after he lost them on one of his drug fueled late nights. My dad slowly pushed the door in enough so that you could see the light of the apartment shine out into the hallway, and he looked down at me and said he smelled something that he recognized. I tried the window in the yard of the building, but it was locked, and an old rusty knife was found lying by. I used it to try and pry the window open, but it just snapped. So the landlord told us that we could use the basement to access the center yard of the building, while all apartments and windows were exposed. So we went down into the basement, into the center yard, and the window to my uncle's apartment was over an old turtle aquarium that the landlord used years before that was filled with freezing water. My dad asked me to get the long ladder that was in the basement and bring it back out. So I did. And as I did, my stepmother stopped me and whispered in my ear, Can you be the one to go inside the house, please? I don't want him finding something he can't handle. I said sure, as months before I encountered something similar. So we set the ladder up and I started to climb up. Well, my dad says, no, please, let me go in. I don't want you to see something terrible. I try to swim slightly into letting me, but my dad is extremely stubborn, so I let him. He climbed up, checked if the window was unblocked, and it was, so he climbed in. 
I couldn't see him anymore, but he said, he isn't here. So I start making my way out of the center yard to go upstairs and await him at the front door of my uncle's apartment. Just as I'm leaving, I hear the most blood-curdling scream I've heard in my life. He's dead! My first reaction was speed. I didn't cry. I wasn't scared. It was adrenaline. My dad was in this apartment, alone, locked in with his dead brother, and I needed to get him out. My stepmother and grandfather started to cry, but I just ran upstairs and started begging on the door. After about six seconds, he unlocked the door and it swung open, and he fell back on the floor where it looked like he had been before he had opened it. I grabbed his arm as he stared to the right of me into the kitchen, while my uncle's blackened, bloated body lay slumped over in a chair, open beer and cigarettes and cell phone next to him, eyes wide open. I grabbed him and yanked him out. He broke down in the hallway crying uncontrollably, screaming, not so much because his brother was dead but because he couldn't believe what he had become. I ran outside again, still not crying and still not scared, just in shock. I called 911 and they asked if I wanted to attempt to resuscitate him. I just told them that he was dead and he had been for a while. After that, the family kept coming to me and asking me if I had known what might have killed him. I pointed to his body a few times out of anger and said, That's an overdose and you all know it and walked out. For months, the family tried to lie to me and say that it wasn't, and one day while my dad was drunk, he admitted the coroner's report said he had died of an overdose of heroin. They also found it in his wallet, so I never really had any doubts. My dad said he thought the person was literally a darker skinned friend of his sleeping in the chair because his skin was so dark, and for a few seconds he couldn't believe it until he saw my uncle's lifeless green eyes staring at the floor when he fell. Turns out he was only dead from Friday night, but since he was leaned over, the blood had pooled in his face and body, giving it a blackish crimson tint and stretching his features. When I was younger, I couldn't sleep with the TV off because I needed something to listen to, to focus my thoughts to sleep. As I got older and started dating, I couldn't sleep with it on because it bothered my significant others. But after that, I couldn't sleep with it on or off because I was afraid when I opened my eyes. He'd be laying there dead. Now, I write a lot of music, and since that's happened, I've become more and more obsessed with death and dying, to the point where it's actually become a healthy coping mechanism, as it's allowed me to accept mortality like no one I know has. Hey guys, Blue Spooky here. I just wanted to thank you all for watching, especially if you made it to the end here. I also want to give a special thank you to my friend Fourth Stories, who is my collaborator on this episode. I'll put a link to her channel in the description so you can go check her stuff out. I apologize for this episode being a little shorter than normal, but it was kind of hard to find these types of stories, so I hope you guys can forgive me. I'll try to put an extra episode out this weekend to make up for it. Uh, as always, I'll have links to my social media in the description. Just in case you want to send me any stories, or if you have any suggestions for stories that you want me to read. And if you have any constructive criticism, please feel free to leave it in the comments below. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I hope you guys have a great day.